and we're going to give uh, everybody just a minute to settle in before we begin. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in again to Velodyne LiDAR's digital learning series, automation and safety during COVID-19. I'm Pamela Gauchi, your host for the next 40 or so minutes. And joining me is my co-host, Mary, who will be running some slides in the background. If you're not already aware, just a couple of days ago, we announced a surprise guest, Ryan Garapi, CTO and co-founder of ClearPath Robotics, which we're really excited about. And I'll be introducing him in just a few minutes, but first we'll take a quick peek at today's agenda. It's pretty simple. I'll start off with a brief overview of Velodyne sensors, highlighting just one of the sensors that ClearPath has integrated into their unmanned vehicles. Then I'll introduce Ryan and we'll get right into interview questions for about 25 minutes or so. And I'll save the last few minutes for some audience Q&A before we sign off. So be sure to use that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask questions anytime during the episode. We are recording today's episode, which will be available to watch on Velodyne LiDAR's YouTube channel. So let's dive in here with this snapshot of several of Velodyne's LiDAR sensors. All of these sensors provide an essential component for robotic autonomy and navigation. We've just highlighted two of them, the Puck and the Ultra Puck, both of which are used in a myriad of applications, including advanced safety, mapping, security, and of course, robotics. ClearPath has integrated both of those sensors into their unmanned ground vehicles. But now I'm gonna dive in just a little bit deeper on the UltraPuck. With 32 channels and a range of up to 200 meters, the UltraPuck generates approximately 1.2 million points per second in dual return mode. That's with 360 degree horizontal field of view and a 40 degree vertical field of view. The UltraPuck's denser channel distribution on the horizon enables higher resolution at longer ranges. Now add to those features a compact footprint, low weight, and an encapsulated package. So what does all of that mean? It means the UltraPuck can meet customer needs with a highly accurate object detection and classification, which is critical for robotics and other applications. In this footage, you're seeing the high density, long range image generated by the UltraPuck on a drive through Nashville, Tennessee. And in addition to this high resolution real time data, the ultras encapsulated package means it can handle harsh environmental conditions and weather. Another critical point for use in unmanned vehicles. Other features include pricing and lower power consumption that allows for longer operational range and redundancy. And here you see a Velodyne sensor integrated into ClearPath's Jackal UGV. You can also see in the background the Jackal is used in some challenging weather and terrain. But our guest today can tell you a little more about ClearPath's unmanned vehicles and the amazing things they're capable of doing. So now I'd like to introduce Ryan Garapi, CTO and co-founder of ClearPath Robotics. Hi, good, Ryan. Uh, Welcome. Good afternoon, Pamela, or I believe it's it's good morning to you. Out, yes. Out west. <laughs> yes. Right. So I'm I'm gonna um dive in uh, dive in right away. Can you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and about how the idea to form ClearPath originated? Sure, of course. Yeah. So I'm, my name is Ryan Garapi, as, as Pamela has just introduced. I'm, I'm from Ontario, Canada, from a town just north of Toronto. And I went to uh, the University of Waterloo for mechatronics engineering. And the reason I say this is because as part of the University of Waterloo, there's a, there's a co-op program, one of the, the world's best, if not the world's best co-op program. And as part of that, I worked for a, a small company at the time called Kiva Systems. Um, I think there were about 30 people. Uh, then, and for those of you who don't know Kiva, they're now known as Amazon Robotics. And I remember at the time, uh, at the time, they really had a problem getting started with uh, with with robotics, building the robots. They had a great idea, but they didn't have the ability to to build them. And uh, long story short, when when I came back, went back to school, and we talked with a number of my uh, colleagues on the UW robotics team, we decided and 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 thought that this robot thing was going to be a big deal that more and more people were going to have a good idea of what, where robots would be useful. And we wanted to be the company that said yes when the next Kiva Systems came along, as opposed to all those other um, New England-based companies that said, no, we won't, uh, we won't take that on. Um, so we, we took that and we looked at, we, for a, a while, we looked at the, 
the the landmine clearance um, problem, which was a, a big challenge, a big challenge as well. But we decided to really stay, uh, stick with our roots and start with uh, robotics research, and that's where ClearPath Robotics and originally the first product of the the Husky came about, uh, because at that time robots was not quite as as accepted as it is now. So it meant that there wasn't any venture capital funding available in any any type for for robots, and especially not for a bunch of just random Canadians from Ontario. So that's so then uh, then as they as they say the the rest is history. So uh, I recently read you were actively working to assist robotics developers and researchers around the world in their efforts to support our healthcare workers and maintain critical infrastructure during uh, the current crisis. Can you talk about what kind of role ClearPath is playing in fighting COVID-19? Yes, of course. In terms of, in terms of helping with, with the current crisis and, and possibly also future crises of the nature of, of this same nature, we're really looking at continuing to do what we do best. And we're, we're making some adjustments and, and to, to accommodate this new challenge. But from the ClearPath Robotics perspective, we want to make it faster and easier for researchers of all stripes to develop new applications for robots, whether those are academic researchers, whether they are industry researchers or government researchers or commercial developers, it doesn't really matter. Right? In the end, if this, this crisis hammers home the need to respond quickly and to not try to reverse engineer your robots or sensors or computers or anything from the ground up. It's, it's about the application. It's about understanding what users want. And on our, our other division, the automotors division, we have continued to, to work on, uh, to continue to work on autonomous material flow and removing these, these low value tasks from the workforce so that people can, so the people in these factories and warehouses can work on, on more fulfilling tasks. And this has only hammered home the need for that. Right. Yeah. Social distancing through robotics is, uh, is something which, which we think will, will significantly improve the health of people who are working in these factories. So and I'm curious, you're in Canada right now, and um, what are you experiencing there right now with shelter in place and, and the COVID-19 crisis? Uh, generally, uh, generally, I'd say from, from my perspective, things are trending well. Uh, we're all, mm -hmm. uh, everyone is aware that, that, the, uh, that there is a second wave coming. Um, but in the, in the near term, our, our curve has flattened in our area, well, nationally. Um, tests are being made available to effectively, as far as I'm aware, if you have any kind of sickness whatsoever, you can get a test now, which is great for improved contact tracing. Um, they're now talking about regional reopening. For example, Toronto still has quite a few number of active cases. I believe it's 75% of Ontario is Toronto. And, but there's other regions around who, who don't have any. So being able to do a regional, uh, more of a regional approach is, is also being discussed. So, and then I think socially, um, socially it's, we're, we are seeing some changes that even though, um, even though people are starting to do their door-to-door -door sales again, they're doing so with face masks, they're doing so respecting you know, physical distance. And I think in some cases, it, this, in some cases we are taking some lessons from some other countries who even before COVID came up, um, they, they were better about wearing, wearing masks and being, uh, being generally more sanitary when someone's sick. So I'm, I'm definitely seeing a lot of those, those changes happen as well. So um, shifting gears a little bit, uh, this webinar episode is titled How Robots Tackle the Deadliest, Dirtiest Jobs. Can you tell us um, about some of the most or a couple of the most interesting use cases for your robots and, and how they tackle those jobs? Yeah, of course. And great timing, Mary. Thank you. Thank you very much for jumping to that slide. And so here we've, we've, we've provided a bunch of different, a bunch of different examples of how people have used our robots over the, the past years. And this is one of the things that I actually find is particularly exciting. Like, of course, the fact that our robots were used to, to help win the, the recent uh, DARPA uh, sub T challenge like that. That's, of course, very exciting. You know, the fact that we've had our stuff, um, you know, featured on BBC and CNN to help understand if robots can be used to move water through India, through rural India, like that's, that's exciting. And as someone who just had to haul a bunch of yard waste out to the, the street, the fact that we've got one of our other robots taking out the trash is also exciting, but they're, they're all like individually cool projects. And I think we've, we've delivered, you know, we've got set, we've got thousands of robots out in the world and actually probably a few hundred independent customizations, like different robots of various sorts. And, and one of the, the things that's actually really exciting is the whole variety. 
of, of what people are now able to do with these common, uh, common sensors, the common platforms that we provide, common pieces of software like TensorFlow and Ross and Gazebo. Um, it's, that's actually the really exciting thing for me is that 10 years ago, like 10 years ago, you, you had to do all this yourself. Right? So you, you didn't, you know, you couldn't build an algorithm. You couldn't do research on a new algorithm within four years, much less actually develop a new application. But now we're seeing in the scope of, of this global pandemic, for example, we're seeing people actually be able to deploy, you know, reasonably industrial ready solutions, fully autonomous in the span of months. And that's, that's, a, that's what's really exciting to me. Very cool. So several years ago, um, you joined a number of other technology leaders supporting an open letter calling on the UN to ban development and use of artificially intelligent weaponry. And you've been pretty vocal about your thoughts on weaponizing AI. Why is that so important to you? And what has the reaction been to ClearPath's position on that? Yeah, uh, that's, that's uh, always the, the interest, uh, the, the question I, I just kind of wait for when I get into one of these, uh, these interviews. Uh, yeah, that was, that was back in 2015. We were the first for-profit company, um, not even robotics company, but the first for-profit company to basically come publicly out and say that autonomous weapon systems, lethal autonomous weapon systems, otherwise known as killer robots, are a bad thing. And I think, or not I think, but the, what we were seeing was that there was a potential for people to not be aware that this was a serious problem. Like we thought that there's, there's always uh, members of civil society of NGOs are always raising the alarm about one piece of technology or another. And in many cases, they're right to raise the alarm, but we figured that first it was our, a, a, a good thing to go and, and bring this up. And second it, was reason, um, second, it might help actually bring a little bit of serious voices to the discussion. Right now that companies are starting to get involved um, and, and we have seen a lot of very, very, uh, much um, more influential voices than ourselves start to get involved. And it really came down to on a personal level and on a corporate level, and I think we were only 20 or 30 people at the time, was knowing how easy it was going to be to build new applications with not only our robots, but with other technology that's becoming more and more available, uh, pace detection systems, better sensors, um, improved power systems. It, uh, this is gonna be different than than when nuclear weapons were developed or, or uh, biological or chemical weapons were developed is that the government wasn't gonna have the control they thought they would. Right? The nuclear, the Manhattan Project and the other efforts to build nuclear weapons were funded by the government's control. So they could, they had their hand on the brake, so to speak, uh, more often than not the throttle, but they certainly had their hand on the brake. And I don't think they fully realized um, or various government experts fully realized at first, this was actually being driven by a lot of ancillary dual use private private work. And second, that just because you can make a just because you can make a perfectly accurate, reliable machine tool doesn't mean you can make a perfectly accurate and reliable soldier. And you know, using using the same technology. And I think, you know, we we'd also also said like it doesn't like there's you can get into all sorts of debates. Like, you know, it, it's not exactly it's not true that not building it yourself means that you're susceptible to others who do build it. Like that's just you know not true at all. But even if even if we look at what's happening uh, now in these these past few weeks, there there does start to raise these questions of of what whether it's right to to build this degree of force multiplication technology, which is another way to look at robots. And you know you it's great when you want force multiplication technology to clean your house. Like that's a Roomba. That's great. But we should also be looking where force multiplication technology starts to come into play elsewhere, especially when it's making decisions that it can't take back. You know, if your if your Roomba if your Roomba cleans the wrong room, or maybe you know your your Roomba you know drags some dirt all over the floor. Well, that's that's pretty easy to take back. But when you get into the the lethal part of lethal autonomous systems, you you didn't want to take that back. And as a company who, as you've seen, as we can see right now on the slides, has is a huge amount of a variety of use cases. I don't want one of those other pictures to be um, to be where some of what they could be easily customized to do um, at scale. And I, I just don't think I could. Uh, I, I don't think that would be a something that myself or a number of other other team members could live with. 
So shifting gears again a little bit, I'm curious, um, what for you is the most exciting or interesting thing about your work and where did your interest in robots and AI come from? I, well, in terms of the latter question is probably easiest. I'll probably, I'm probably just going to rely on, uh, I'm just going to rely on Star Wars and Star Trek there, probably the <laughs> R2-D2 and Data. Um, just, just that sort of, just that sort of thing. I played with a lot of Lego as a kid too, but you know, I, I'm just, I'm not quite sure, honestly, it's just, it's just been so long, but I know, I know when you get into, when you go beyond the, the childhood thing and you get into university, there's always something um, fun about, you know, being able to build something that, that actually physically reacts to the world, right? It like, it moves around it inhabits the same space you are. And it's, it's just, there's just something cool about that. And uh, in terms of what's cool uh, or what, what I, what I like in the, what I like to see most recently, it really comes back to what I said already. It's just that this is that we're, we're seeing this incredible acceleration of what can be done here. Like we're seeing this, this possibility that you don't, that people don't need to be doing the proverbial dull, dirty and dangerous jobs. Like I'm very lucky. I can all honesty, like I sit in, I have a, I'm, I'm working from home. I work from home. Uh, we're coming up on four months now. I think it was March 10th was the last day I was in my office. And, and I'm, I'm comfortable and there's, you know, no one watching over my shoulder to see if I'm doing work or not, but we've got a lot of other people who, you know, they're, they're essential workers, but they're paid below minimum wage in some cases. And uh, they don't, and on top of that, they're basically treated like automatons. And I believe that humans are better than this and we should, um, that we can, and, and that the rapid progress of robotics is allowing us to get the, to have the tools as society to both make everyone's job jobs better um, as well as, as safer. So I'm, I'm going to shift gears again, um, specifically to LIDAR. So why is LIDAR an essential oh, right. component I mean. yeah. um, <laughs> of your unmanned vehicles and uh, robots? Why is it essential? Well, I mean, as, as everyone and probably everyone who's in this conversation knows that there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of voices out there, most, most promising, uh, most, most loudly being Elon Musk saying, well, humans don't have LIDAR, then so why use LIDAR? And the response I would have to that is that, well, you know, humans don't have wheels either. So like, why do our cars have wheels? Like, I think, and from a theoretical perspective, the concept of a range and bearing sensor, which is what LIDAR is, it just makes everything so much easier. Like just on the, on the computation side and in terms when we don't have this kind of artificial general intelligence that's been trained from birth and has, you know, in some cases, you know, pathways laid down through evolution for detecting, for discerning depth or for, for learning over time and learning through classification and learning through interaction, excuse me, then LIDAR is just, it's a shortcut and it's a great shortcut. And when we're looking to really chase the change, the face of, uh, you know, change the face of, of the world with robotics and automation, and I want as many shortcuts as we can get. And it's, it just lets you get up and started really easy, easily. Um, and then, but then the other nice thing is if you continue from there, it, it's a lot easier to start building safety stories around LIDAR. Right? And, and when we look at our, you know, on the clear path robotic side, people do all, all sorts of different wacky things with our robots, but on the automotive side, there we have hundreds of vehicles out in the world operating in production and safety critical roles. There's, you can't have a safety driver there. They, they need to operate day in and day out and they need to be like literally perfectly safe, like uh, performance level D safety, which is something like one dangerous failure every million plus hours of operation. Mm -hmm. And we have the potential to, to help right now and we really don't wanna wait for whatever kind of, of guaranteed safety, approvable safety around vision systems will uh, we'll ever have uh, or we'll, we'll get to. Because, you know, I will say like there's an existence proof as some might say that humans can navigate without LIDARs. Like we, we are our own existence proof there. But on the other hand, in the real world, people hold automation and robotics to a much higher standard of safety than they do people. Um, and we don't yet have a, an existence proof around people can navigate at some of these levels. Um, you know, in with, with poor, you know, when they're tired, when they're tired, when they're under the influence or what have you. So I think just being able to get to take that shortcut 
and get LIDAR out to take that shortcut and get these systems out there and understand the actual challenges in human robot interaction um, in, in dynamics and localization, what have you, without worrying about the safety of the, the camera is, I think is important for us. So uh, for ClearPath, what types of specs or features are you focusing on when you're looking at LIDAR? Yeah, so since generally, uh, I mean, generally, if we're talking about, well, you know, more talk, let's talk more about the 3D aspects of LIDARs and the 2D planar LIDARs, because that's what we're all here for. But actually, in some cases, it really does come down to some standard specs in general. It's just that they need to be, you know, reliable and robust, and they need to have some degree of, of field, proven field experience, right? Whether you're a researcher or a developer or, or, or what have you, you need to be able to trust your platform. You need to have it as a foundation. And then the, the, other, the other item would be, um, the other items to go up another level would be how easy it is to integrate. And that's just from a mechanical perspective an electrical perspective. And, you know, from a software perspective, we just say there, there just should be a ROS driver. It's just, you know, ROS isn't perfect. I will be, I'll be the first one to say that. And I've been working, uh, our company was also the first for-profit company to do work with ROS. That was in 2010. And, um, actually maybe 2011, can't remember. Um, but, <laughs> but it does get you started very quickly. So ROS compatibility was, has, has always been a big thing for us with sensors. And then if we, if we focus in further on the 3D LiDAR side of things, first 3D LiDARs are expensive, right? They're more expensive than cameras and planar LiDARs. And they're, they're from a first principles basis, they'll be that way for a while. So um, the 360 degree um, arc in general, like when in doubt, that's a good thing to have. You know, once you start to establish, like engineer your system into a product, then you may want to use a uh, half arc or, you know, quarter arc systems to, to take into account that you may not want to put a single LiDAR on a mast, or you just may want to have multiple of multiple full arc systems around you, but that's, it's just really good to you know, put a LiDAR, like pay, buy one expensive LiDAR, put it on a stick and go with that. Um, and then purely from a, a business perspective, the fact that when we can go with a supplier that has this, uh, a very broad product line in terms of the price performance, like that we can adjust the price performance ratio, so to speak, like how many channels do we want? What's our range? And the fact that I can maintain that relationship or we can maintain that relationship uh, with with a handful of suppliers versus have to go and resource a component all every single time that that just makes my life easy from a business perspective. I know you know some of our uh, um, some of our inventory shelves are kind of like Toyland because we've got lidars and GPSs and computers and all this sort of stuff. And um, as much as that's great when I'm building something, when I have to look at the finances of the business, you start to realize how much inventory costs are carrying, and it's it's nice to not have to. Um, it's not. It's nice to not have to maintain all of these different supplier relationships um, when we're talking about some core developments. So you I, you touched a little bit on on what I was going to ask you next. So all of ClearPath's robots work on ROS. Why did you choose ROS as the main operating system? Originally, we didn't. Um, uh, and actually, to come back to the original topic or the original inspiration for the company. One of our other uh, fundamental pieces was that there's always going to be more people outside of our company who are who are good at, at building robots than inside of the company, right? That that is true no matter how big of a company you are. The majority of good people who are working on your technology or your related technology don't work for you. So we know that we wanted to to support open source and really work within the open source community, and we started with Player Stage, which a lot of uh, a lot of people don't. Um, surprising amount of people don't really know. And then, and then we, um, and then in 2010, yeah, and so it would have been 2010. In 2010, we went to ICRA and Anchorage, and there we had some conversations with Willa Garage, um, who was, as some people might know, the, the initial organization that, that took Ross out of Stanford and made it into something else. And one of the things that we were actually really impressed by was not so much the actual technical details, because there were and still are quite a few different frameworks to work with robots like Yarp or Rokos and what have you. But it was more that the commitment to the end-to-end -end community, right? That there was documentation, that they cared about the install, um, that they cared about the install scripts and, and what have you. And even now it's not perfect, right? Like ROS1, for instance, was very focused on the single robot case with the PR2 and other manipulators. ROS2 has taken it a very long way, but it really is a commitment to that, to building the community. And you can see that as just in like little details, like the choice of licenses um, that Ross was, or Ross one was always you know, BSD or equivalent license that encouraged people to build businesses around it. And then I know um, in, 
I can't even remember when this was, I'd have to check my CV, but in, you know, oh, I don't know, 2012, 2011, 13, I don't know. Um, we founded the Open Source Robotics Foundation. So I was a founding member of the board there and, and still remain on the board. And when we switched to ROS2, one of the things we talked about from the, the board governance level, like we didn't get into the technology at the board level, we let the community handle that, but we said it was critical that there is an open source um, libraries for DDS, which was effectively became the underlying after a down select process became the underlying communication standard. And we said there must be a, an open source option there. So it really is that commitment. And as I've said, um, on many occasions, like you'd, you'd be the first to think that I'm a Ross apologist because I, you know, co-founded the OSRF and then I've, I've helped organize nine Ross cons, like just all of the Ross, all the global Ross cons so far. Um, but it, it has its big problems, but I would say beyond that, like it's so better than everything. It's so much better than everything else that used to be out there. It still is out there. And I hope there's others that can, that can take the lesson and actually do better than Ross in specific areas. Um, and I'll be the first to give people advice on how to do that. But in the end, like I, it shaved, it has saved probably person centuries, if not person millennia by now, um, by how much it's saved. We can hire someone into the company and they can be productive on the first day writing apps for robots. Like that's huge. Great. So um, I do want to say congratulations because we heard that you recently closed Series C funding. So we can uh, you tell us what are your plans for Auto Motors, which is a division of ClearPath? Yeah, of course. Well, generally, uh, Auto and to a, to a more broader extent, the, the global market for AMRs is continuing to really establish itself. Um, or it's continued to be established. Companies like ourselves and a few others have, have crossed the proverbial chasm and aren't just selling pilots anymore. We, we've got the full story in place for support, for deployment, um, for upgrades. These days, it's all about remote upgrades and commissioning. So we're doing all of that. Um, and it's really about that there is, there's, there's funding required to sustain that kind of growth. We just recently announced that formal expansion with partners into Japan. Uh, the full expansion in Europe has been, you know, we've been going, um, you know, testing the market there for a while and that's happening as well. There are, and there's a number of other products that we're also looking to accelerate. So it really is continuing to establish, um, to continue to establish ourselves as a trusted enterprise partner for these companies, because these companies, you know, there's a lot of these companies who tried out the one robot, they tried out the 10 robots. And now they want to know what their company is going to look like with the, the hundred robots or the thousand robots. And we want to make sure that we've got all the pieces in play to both help make sure that we are, you know, that we put forward a strong case there and to also ensure that the quality of, of service um, and products that they've come to expect, you know, in, let's say North Americans in smaller scale continues to expand. And we're now at the point where even we have a single, we have a deployment in place right now, which has about, you know, it's, they're, they're building a new factory. It's going to have about a hundred different, um, a hundred different um, auto AMRs in a single fleet. And that's, that's just exciting, but it, it, you know, it takes infrastructure uh, and it takes capabilities to maintain, excuse me, not only doing that the first time, but making sure that we can continue doing that on a, on a global basis. Great. So I have a I have time for a couple more questions before we move to audience Q&A. Um, I did see an article this week about a research project ClearPath is part of that explores development of swarms of fully autonomous robots capable of planetary exploration. Exploration. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's an, actually that's another cool thing is that is that I get sent things by people that I have absolutely no idea about what was going on until I clicked through the article. So this what this project is is actually related to um, the the DARPA, uh, the DARPA sub T program for anyone who's familiar, there was a, it's, it's kind of a, the successor competition to the urban, uh, not urban challenge, now I'm dating myself, the, um, uh, the disaster response challenge. And it was about uh, like, you know, autonomous vehicles that can navigate in challenging, you know, underground environments, mines or construction sites or what have you. And what this is, is just really looking to extend all of that infrastructure that, that the, in this case, the uh, JPL, the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab built. And their you know, the JPL worked with our platforms. I believe they also worked with Boston Dynamics. So now this is actually the other great thing of, that this technology has moved to is that these, it wasn't just a bunch of robots, you know, built by grad students and then which will be de facto abandoned when they graduate. These robots are here as a standard plant foundation and now they can be reused, which is I think generally good all, uh, you know, good in general. 
Great. So um, I have time for one final question before audience Q&A. Um, what are your thoughts on the next big breakthrough in robotics? Uh, technical or business? Technical. Mm. Harder one. Um, I think I think there is there's a lot of options. Um, there's a, there's a lot of things to be said for what goes, you know, beyond the deep learning powered pattern recognition, um, or or you know image recognition. That there's there's still a lot. That I think people in the AI or not. I think I know people in the AI field are starting to go beyond, you know, deep learning and just you know, throw a bunch of a bunch of images at a comp net and see what comes out the other side. There's more and more influential voices saying, well. What about actual world understanding? And I think that's that's a really interesting thing with um, with robotics in general. I think there's also some stuff to be said about just um, uh, I can't remember the, the the right term off offhand, but just just the, the the benefits that come from economies of scale, um, not only from the financial perspective, but also just from understanding the environment, right? Like right now, when we started Auto, for example. We were we had to like assess each each facility for if localization will work, right? If we if we would get lost. Now I know that it, you know our answer are now it's like is it an indoor factory? Yes. Well, the robot will work, right? And I think like we don't need to question ourselves anymore. And I think there's some really exciting technical benefits when you achieve that economy of scale, both through physical uh, robots out in the world and also through enhanced uh, simulation tools and data sets and what have you. So um, I'll move to a couple of uh, audience questions right now. Um, one question, how are your robots built to take on very rugged terrain? That, well, I mean, initially we just started building things in the Canadian winter and then we just kind of went from there. <laughs> um, but, it, but in all seriousness, um, in all seriousness, some of the points that you might have to do to build a small robot for rugged terrain, it's, you can build them simpler than you would a, a car. Uh, because robots and solid state electronics don't really care about vibrations and comfort as much as people do. So if you look at the Husky, for example, which are our flagship robot, um, and it's, it's, you know, one of my personal favorites that it, it's got some big tires and that's, that's worked pretty well for it. And once you start to get up to high levels of rugged terrain, then it's, it's less about building a robot and more about automating an existing vehicle. Right. And that's, this is another exciting trend that we're seeing in the industry now is that there are quite a few other machinery companies and vehicle companies, which, you know, five, even five years ago, we're not sure if this robot thing was going to go. And now they've all built their, they've, they've all been building control by wire vehicles and also the trend towards vehicle electrification, which is a, you know, generally unrelated to robotics has also made their vehicles easier to automate. So if you're, if you're talking about, you know, what's the best way to build a robot that can handle the same construction site as a bulldozer, my answer would be just, you know, get the bulldozer. Um, and there's, there's obviously like we've, we've made some change, like you don't build bulldozers that can run inside of, of academic labs, which is why we hand build our smaller, our chassis. Um, but if you look at something like the Warthog UGV or the Moose UGV, that's actually a collaboration. Uh, that's actually a collaboration with, a, with an ATV company, um, which, is, uh, which is also a Canadian based ATV company. And we, uh, you know, we try to, to share lessons back and forth on that. And another question here I see is what types of speeds do your uh, unmanned vehicles go? I've, I don't actually don't know the top speed of the moose right now. I think it's something like, I think it's something like 10 or eight or 10 meters per second, something like that. Um, fast enough to be, you know, worrisome if you're doing research work. Generally we found, uh, generally we found in the research space and that kind of the human robot interaction space that you know, the, the one to four meter per second rain is a nice, is a nice top speed to handle. Uh, the Husky does one meter per second. Uh, the Jackal does two meters per second. And those are, you know, sometimes we customize them for faster or slower, but, you know, human walking pace, I believe at, uh, at you know, just walking around the neighborhood, you're walking at about 1.4 meters per second. I apologize for all the, all the people listening who are not, who I'm not giving the miles per hour, kilometers per hour references, but yeah. Um, but I found that, yeah, the, the one to two meters per second is, is a good number when you're doing, when, especially when you're doing things like, when you're doing initial research, for example, you want to be able to, it's a lot easier to be able to chase your robot down. Um, and we found even there's, there's a number of large self-driving car companies and research companies that come to mind who, even before they put their stuff on a self-driving car, they'll actually start with something like Husky, 
um, they, whether they're doing you know, new, new GPU design, new sensor design, or things like TensorFlow, what have you, they'll start with something like a Husky because you can, you can smoke test the overall system design. And then once you, if you want it to run like a car, then usually just, you just go with a car. So how many, um, how many robots do you have deployed across the globe? I, it's, I feel the answer is between three and 4,000. I'm not actually quite sure these days. I know I was, as I said, the Husky is one of my favorites because it still actually runs some code I wrote. And I think we've shipped <laughs> 600 Huskies, most of which are in different, uh, have, are completely wildly customized, which is also exciting. So uh, we have time for one, one final question. Um, what are some of the ways we can tell if a robot is real world ready? For example, hobby robots are clearly not real world ready. So what are some of the qualities that you look at? Uh, well, if you ask my test team, I just hit them with hammers. Um, <laughs> but, but I think in seriousness, in seriousness, it does come down to like where you're testing it. Um, sometimes it's how many literal scars does the robot have. I remember going to a, a site where they had 40 of our, our auto 1500 AGVs and they were, they, the outsides were beaten up. They were, they had hydraulic fluid just leaked all over them from what they were carrying. They were like bent pieces of like some of the like skins on the outside were, were fairly bent up, but they were still driving. Right. So, and I think part of it is, you know, hand it, I mean, the first test is hand it to someone who doesn't really, who isn't going to be careful with it. And in our company, I'm one of those people. Hand it, you know, hand it to a, you know, hand it to a 10 year old who's played a lot of video games and see what happens. Um, and the other thing is just also, it's just having some runtime behind it. And I know this is a big difference between academics and industry that isn't sometimes respected. Um, I remember there was someone had just joined our autonomy team and wrote a cool algorithm and it run, ran overnight and they were very happy with that. And in most academic literature, that would be enough to get you a publication. And the answer was like, okay, that is really great work. But I mean, I can't even show that to our own engineering team without 400 hours of continuous uninterrupted runtime. And it, you know, just, just starting from there, like some of our test robots, I think some of our own test robots internally have, you know, 10 to 20,000 kilometers of autonomous running, just kind of driving inside like a little test space that we have. So it really comes down to, you know, where are you testing? How are you testing it? Um, uh, how are you testing it? And, and what's, you know, what distance are you traveling, right? Like start to ask questions. Like if we're talking about robotics, you know, start to ask pretty equivalent uh, mechanical questions. Like, you know, what, what's your MTBF? Like, what do you do for halt testing? Um, what's your policy around DFX? How do you manage? What do you do with quality inspections, manufacturing? Sometimes just understanding where, if it's a startup company, maybe they don't have everything like that in place yet, but understanding where they've got their information from, you know, to use some examples of, of the team that we have on, at Auto and ClearPath, the, uh, our, our manufacturing VP was, you know, was X aerospace and, uh, and uh, large vehicle construction, large vehicle construction. And the person who runs our, um, our, our um, you know, in-market hardware team was formerly from BMW. So though that's not, you know, pedigree isn't everything, it is at least a sign that, that if, if it's a startup that you're talking to, that they are respecting the need to have some of these processes in place and they don't just, they don't just wonder what's, what's going on. But I mean, I would, you know, vet them the same way. If you're gonna buy, you know, if you're gonna spend $50,000 on, on a mill, like on a, you know, on a machine tool, what questions would you ask? So um, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, no problem, because you have our contact information right there on your screen. So you can reach out to us with any questions about unmanned vehicles, clear path robotics, or Velodyne LiDAR sensors. Again, this webinar recording will be available to view on Velodyne's YouTube channel. I want to thank Ryan again for joining us. It's been really fascinating. I actually have one, one minor note here, if okay. it's okay. Um, sure. I know that, I know that the, uh, the marketing team likes to save me some incoming emails, but if you do have technical questions, my email is ryan at clearpathrobotics.com. Um, it might take a while, but I, I do try to respond. So feel free. <laughs> Great, thanks, thanks for adding that in there. Um, I do, um, again, thank you, Ryan. It's been awesome having you on. And uh, I wanna thank our audience also. And if you're interested in learning more about automation and safety during COVID-19, join us for our next episode on Friday, June 19th, when we'll be featuring Vikrant Agarwal from Local Motors. Thank you. Have a great weekend, everyone.